Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, I'm excited to welcome Andrew Keegan onto the podcast to talk about all things music education. Andrew's passion for teaching is on another level, and wherever you are in your career, young or old, master or apprentice, I know you're going to love this episode. Before we get started, I'd like to ask a small favour. One of the ways to help ensure this podcast reaches the many, many teachers not using social media is to leave a review wherever you are listening. It should only take a second, and it would mean so much to know that these interviews were reaching those they can help. As a thank you, one reviewer will be chosen at random during episode eight of season two and receive signed copies of Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics, Christopher Such's The Art and Science of Primary Reading, Shannon Doherty's 100 Ideas for Primary Teachers, Maths, and the Research Ed Guide to Curriculum which features none other than Neil Almond. So without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary music education. So Andy, we we always start with our guests in numbers, just to get a flavour of who they are. Yep. And so obviously you know the rules, you can only answer with numbers. And my first question is years as a teacher. Uh, 15 years as a teacher. Um, I, I, if you include my PGC year, then I'll be 16, so 15 qualified, yeah. Last year group taught? Four. Most important year group? I'm going to go with minus one. <laughs> and I, I, what, I, mean, I mean reception with that one. Um, I, 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 you know, listening to other people, it is, it's, a, it's an impossibly difficult question to answer that one because everyone will have their reasons for lots of different things. But I think if you, if you set up your reception really well, then you're setting up everybody else for pro for good progress i think so i'm gonna i'm gonna go with minus one but why i mean i mean reception with that excellent i'm with you on that one favorite year group uh year four can play number of instruments i'm gonna go a tentative three because i've played three different instruments on the radio but but uh, yeah, it's it's a really tricky one. As as a musician, I will try and turn my hand to all sorts of different things. Um, but if, if you're looking for some sort of proper competence, then three I'll go with. Excellent. Number of instruments owned? Um, I had a quick count round. Um, I I'm going for twenty five. Wow. Um, I I'm not sure if you can see see just behind me there. <laughs> I've got a rack of five trumpets hanging up there just just to add up a load of instruments i've got lots of kind of weird and wonderful things um like people people will send me random brass instruments every now and then and this, you can see that one there at the top there i've got a post horn which is three or four foot long which is great i've got ran, random kind of antique stuff like that as well so i'll go with 25 because i've got a load of uh, percussion instruments as well some things that i've made myself just because you know Nice, that's impressive. I think you, when we were going to go to Research Ed Cymru in, was it 2020? And yeah. you were, did you have a, a competition that weekend as well? I did, yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd played in a, um, I played for a brass band. And when, <laughs> pre-pandemic, then the, the brass band world is actually, um, f- there's lots of competition goes on. And they have a national competition. I'm not sure if you've seen a film, Brass Off. Yeah. Um, from the mid nineties, um, so the the end of that uh, com- uh, the competition they go to the, the the Albert Hall is the the championship section. It's like the Premier League. The the, the absolute top bands go there. But you, what you have to do is you have to compete at a national level first. You, so they have what's called areas. So so Wales is just one area, um, and England is split up into all sorts of. You got north, south, north, east, north. You know all sorts of different. Uh, different areas so on that particular day i'd actually been in swansea um competing in the welsh area and then i was supposed to jump a train to cardiff to meet up with you guys to go to research ed but the weather was so bad it was during one of those storms i can't remember the name of the storm now um but it was so bad that they'd literally cancelled all public transport and everything and it was just it was it was impossible to get there even driving would have been difficult because the motorways there's a couple of stretches on the m4 which are quite uh, busy and they tend to close them in in high winds as well so yeah, I'd, I'd been competing in a contest that morning and was due to to come over. But I think the, the last couple of years worth of of anything has just been a write off because they, they've already um, cancelled because they, they tend to hold the, the area competitions in um, 
kind of March, end of February, March time. Um, and it, it, everything's already been cancelled, um, which is understandable, to be honest with you. I think we're just waiting for a reset in the, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the autumn, maybe, where things can possibly pick up again. It's been, it's been a real difficult time, actually, for musicians, um, generally, because it's, it's, it's a massive outlet for, for lots of people. You know, it's, it's, apart from being a social thing, you know, the, it's, I think this is the first year that I, I didn't play a single Christmas concert, for example. You know, I, I didn't play a single Christmas carol at all, not even in school. You know, it's, it's been a real, really interesting, difficult year music, music wise. So, yeah, my fingers crossed that I'll, uh, I'll pick up again. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm just thinking, I think that Comrie was on February 29th ish. And, and that was probably the last time yeah. I wasn't thinking, you know, the worst thing that was happening was driving up the M3 or whatever in uh, torrential rain at 11 o'clock at night, you know, and then yeah. a couple of weeks later, everything was totally totally different and um, so back to the highest grade of those instruments grade eight lowest grade, grade eight on my track uh i'm gonna go with zero <laughs> i actually I've, I've only ever done grades um on the trumpet uh i haven't actually done grades on anything else um i was practicing for grade five piano when i was at school but i never got around to taking the exam so yeah zero lowest grade podcasts just the one one podcast and enjoyably futile podcast episodes 20 20 so far because obviously i think we've got um i think there's eight weeks there's eight episodes left of this series so i, I tend to run the ep- the podcast every two weeks um i started off just tr- i started off trying to do one a week and it was it was impossibly difficult to try and get it done because like you know like you know you know recording editing finding time to interview people you know, it, it takes up quite a bit of time to try it. So I took it down to two weeks. So I've probably got about four or five episodes left of this series um, and maybe an additional one just to round up the series. We'll have to see. I reckon I reckon our world's online sort of crossover overlap quite a bit. Um, but if anyone's listening and they're not sure what the Enjoyably Futile podcast is about, what, how would you sum it up for them? Uh, so... <laughs> If anyone follows me or follow, to be fair, not just follows me, but follows um, Twitter on a Monday evening. So Monday evening is um, kind of qu- kind of quiz time on BBC TV. So you have, at the moment, you have Mastermind, Only Connect and University Challenge. And I started running a game about 18 months, maybe two years ago now. Um, basically, the, this, the premise is really simple. We just try and predict... Um, answers that are going to come up on that evening show of University Challenge. A bit like bingo. You just pick some pick some random answers and see if they come up. Um, and it started off as two or three people playing. And then all of a sudden, um, we've jumped to, I think, it, the average is between kind of 100 and 120 people a week joining in. Um, and that you know ramps up in terms of notifications and, and tweet numbers, which is huge. Um, and the community from that became quite big so what i started doing was i started running the the enjoyably futile podcast and um, because someone described the, the game as being enjoyably futile because it's it's a fun thing to do but it is very very difficult to win you know I, out of out of 100 120 people a week i might get i think the most i've had is 13 winners a week um but i, I you know usually it's only four or five people which is a small percentage of, of winners but it's it's good fun so the Enjoyably Futile podcast is kind of, it stems from that. So we talk about the University Challenge, uh, the episodes that have been, um, and then I have, I have a guest, I have an interview with people, and we just, sometimes we just talk about random stuff that's kind of fun, difficult, um, and we run some quizzes and just have a bit of fun for half an hour, really. Nice. Um, yeah, it, it, it's always really enjoyable um, to listen to it. Um, and... I listened to Lloyd, who obviously was on the, the, the sort of pilot episode of this podcast. And yeah. one of his impossible questions was about a university with the postcode BT7. Yes. Yeah. So obviously, knowing exactly where Queen's University Belfast is, I'm thinking I, I would have had a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I try and go out of my way and pick questions that I know people aren't going to know. So I, I absolutely would not have asked you that question because the whole, the whole point is that they're supposed to be impossibly difficult questions. Um, but that's, that's why I asked him about, um, about Penge and Porth Call because um, uh, Lloyd's from just down the road from Porth Call from Bridgend, I think it is. And um, 
I think he'd been working in Southwark because Penge is southeast London. It's like the the, the the end of the road for the 176 bus, I think it is. And then the next stop is Croydon, I believe. Um, so I, li- I like to pick things that are sort of linked to people, but things that aren't going to be too obvious, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. I was shouting at the shouting at the radio. Will <laughs> <laughs> um, Will on, um, and then tweets. Uh, I had to have a look. Actually, um, I'm up to thirty four point one thousand. Oh, I think that is exactly the same as Shannon, possibly. Um, yeah, I, I, funny enough, I, I just listened to Shannon's episode because she 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 pointed out that mo- most people from from your previous podcasts had been. Uh, embarrassed by how high their numbers were. So oh, I've done like four or five thousand. I'm sitting there going, no, I've done thirty-four thousand. But I, I I would add that a lot of that has come over the past couple of years from a Monday night. You know, I I'll send anywhere in the region of two hundred tweets on a Monday evening because either just replying to people or joining in conversations. So you know if you if you add that up over a couple of years, it's 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 a huge number of tweets just for that that particular game. Yeah, because you're trying to get back to absolutely everybody who enters and stuff, and then there's a conversation. Yeah, and it and it is it is really hard um, because you have this flurry of about an hour, an hour and a half of people replying, and 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 some people will reply to the original tweet, some people won't, some people will use the hashtag, some people won't use the hashtag, so it makes it really difficult trying to find people. But I, I try and make sure that I reply to everybody, but it means that that it, just by doing that it adds up 120 tweets, and that's not including any additional. You know, joining in with whatever people are saying. Yeah, uh, that's completely understandable. And then, probably the most important question: Highway <laughs> Sixty One revisited or nineteen ninety nine? Oh, do you know? I think <laughs> this is probably going to be the hardest question you're going to ask me today because, uh, and this is this is actually something I'm going to talk about later on. Is that I, I don't think that that it's comparable. I don't think you can choose. I, I think it depends on what what mood you're in. Um, I th- I, I'm, I'm going to tentatively say 1999, I think, but I know I'm going to uh, upset a lot of fans by say- <laughs> by saying that opposite. But it, but you could you could add in any any album into that, and it would just be you you would just cause ructions. I think you know. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go with I'm going to stick with what I say. I'm going to say 1999. I think. Yeah, no, I think um, they both share a lot of commonality, but um, as you say, there you can't compare them directly with each other. You know, in terms of how no. they impacted on music and um, you know both both big big albums and um, so it, it's just me being mischievous putting that in there really <laughs> oh, i don't mind that i like i like a bit of a controversy in a podcast why not <laughs> so you're a teacher music specialist and maths lead tell us about your journey and how you got here um all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little bit further back than just teaching because i think it's important to uh to kind of understand what, what what kind of goes on in my head generally. So I'm going to take you back, best part of 30 years. Um, I think if people are being really pedantic, we'll say 29 years to when I was eight and I first started making music and started playing um, trumpet. Because over, over the time that I've been teaching and that I've been doing things, I have tried to kind of move away from music to do other things. Um, but I think there's just that inherent need and desire to play music which kind of drives everything that that, that I've ever done to be honest with you um so yeah, I started playing music when I was eight and that pretty much took up most of my time um you know I had to make some quite big choices you know I had to make choices between music and sport for example because they happened at the same time so I, I did music um talking of um of contests for example you know I, I started contesting with brass bands when I was 16 and had to give up a lot of other things because they, they take up a lot of time. Um, and then I went to university to do uh, a music degree at the University of Liverpool. And I did, pro- this is where teaching kind of comes into it. I did probably what a lot of music students do is I took on a couple of private pupils um, just to earn a couple of extra quid, to be honest with you, you know, beer tokens and stuff like that, you know, just so I could afford to, to kind of live. Um, and from that, I got taken on at uh, an after school club um, who offered music lessons and other things. They offered kind of art and drama and all sorts of creative things at an after school club um, in the Everton Valley um, uh, area of Liverpool. 
And I just kind of, I, I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed the kind of, the, the joy that, that young people got out of, of particularly making music. Um, so following my degree, um, you know, I was, I was in that position as a 20 year old trying to figure out what on earth I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, so I kind of followed in, I've, I've got a, an educational family as well. My mum is a teacher, my stepfather um, was a teacher and teacher educator. So I kind of, I had a, a, a good idea of, of what the job entailed. So I, I did my PGCA um, and then following that, <laughs> the, the advice I was given um, was that if I wanted to find a job, the best thing to do would probably be to move to London. Because jobs in jobs in Liverpool are very very hard to come by, um, and I'm sure lots of people will have, have had this experience in their time. You know, you're not necessarily going to be able to find a job where you grew up, um, so you move away to to a bigger city, to a bigger place, or where where there's going to be jobs. Especially in something like music, you know, music departments are not massive departments in schools. Um, you know, I, I've worked as a, as a department of one. And I've worked as a department as four, you know, it, and, and they, you've got that real um, difference. So I moved to London and I got a job out in Surrey. Um, I was living in southeast London at the time. I was working out in Surrey um, and I was there for about 18 months. I did my NQT and stayed for a little bit longer, but um, the commute was absolutely crippling. Um, you know, I was having to leave my house at... <laughs> like six o'clock in the morning to get to work on time because if I missed the train or if I missed the bus, I, it was just an absolute nightmare. So after that, I, I went on supply um, just for a bit, just to kind of put the feelers out and see what else was there. And um, so I, I should should say that my, my PGC originally was in um, secondary music um, originally, but I also did a day a week working with the Liverpool Music Service. Um, and part of that actually involved going in for half a day to teach primary music. Um, so I had a quite a broad um, experience of, of training, but I'm sure a lot of people have said as well, um, the, the, P, the PGC is a bit like learning to drive a car in that they, they teach you how to pass the test, but you don't really start learning about teaching or driving until you actually get behind the driver's seat and get going. You know, it, it's, it's, it's that starting point, but actually you've got a lot more to learn. You know, I, and even after 15 years, I'm, something's always coming up and I'm going, oh, I need to ask someone about this because I'm not sure. You know, it's 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 a never-ending learning learning curve. Um, so I so my my NQT year I did as a as a secondary teacher, um, but I went on supply, and I got a phone call one day randomly just saying, "Oh, this 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 primary school needs a PPA teacher. Would you be up for it?" I'm like, "Well, I've never taught full time in, in a primary school before. I'll give it a go. See see what it's like." Um, but I was it was quite a good opportunity because it was three days a week PPA, so I wasn't planning anything i was being given the work so it was a really great opportunity just to kind of hone my teaching craft and learn about the primary curriculum without having to do a lot of the work myself it sounds a bit lazy but it was actually quite nice because there were experienced teachers giving me things to work on so i could see what year five and year four and year three and year six and year one were working on in maths and literacy so it was actually a really good opportunity um and, and I found myself preferring working in the primary setting, um, if I'm honest. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to be negative about secondary teaching at all because you know, one of the things I do miss about working in a secondary school is I do miss teaching GCSE and A-level music. You know, having that really higher level discussion and creative processes where you're producing compositions, which are borderline professional in some cases. But I, I, I do prefer working in a primary setting because... It's, it's just a really broad um, thing to work in. You know, you're teaching all subjects in, in most part. And again, I'll, I'll talk about this later on. Um, and it, it just comes down to personal preference, I think. Um, and there are some people that will say opposite. They'll say that they'd much prefer working in a secondary school because they can't possibly see how they could work with the younger children. Whereas some people say they can only work with reception, for example, because they can't work with the juniors. You know, it's, it all comes down to um, personal preference. Um, so yeah, I, I worked there for, for a year, pretty much just kind of learning how the, the primary, the primary curriculum worked. Um, but again, I kind of hit a bit of a point where I didn't really know whether I wanted to stay in London or not. Um, so I moved back to the Northwest and I got a job in, um, near Wigan, 
near St. Helens, sorry, um, in the northwest of England. Um, but, but at the same time, I had also met um, Rachel, my now wife. So we kind of lived apart for the first year and then I moved back to London. But what was quite nice was I'd gone back to the same school that I'd done my PPA cover in but this time I went back as a class teacher the head teacher took me on as a full-time teacher which was really great you know because I'd had that opportunity to kind of practice and learn how primary schools worked and then I was going in almost as an NQT really and and having that kind of um that opportunity then to carry on and also because because of the nature of, of working in London and I'm sure lots of people will find this that um opportunity comes up very very quickly um when you're working in the city um so very very quickly i i I got a tlr position um and things like that so again it gave me the opportunity just to kind of dip my toes in the kind of leadership area and see see how those sorts of things worked and kind of learning how to have discussions with people you know when you've when you've looked through people's books or when you've you know when you've sat in the part of a lesson things like that so that was quite nice um and then after a little while having spent piles and piles and piles of money uh, renting a tiny little flat in Clapham. We kind of had to make a few decisions about whether or not we wanted to stay in London forever. So um, we, we decided that we wanted to kind of move and, you know, you're looking around about where to move to. The, the, the choices were pretty much either move back up to the northwest where I'm from or move to South Wales, which is where uh, Rachel's from. So we, we moved to Wales and it was it was almost like pressing a reset button um and i gotta say that you know rachel has always wanted to be a teacher she went to university to do um she did a teaching degree she's always wanted to be a teacher she's always wanted that's what she wants to do um and she's a very very good teacher and she was um uh literacy coordinator in the school we were in and even for her coming back back to where we are it was like nobody knew who we were and trying to find work was very very difficult to begin with um but as as time went on, you know, we we found things eventually. Um, I went back to, um, I went back to secondary school for a couple of years. Um, but it was it, it's very very different, um, in terms of expectations, in terms of what we were teaching. Um, so I was teaching uh, WJC uh, music, and I'd never taught WJC music before. So having to having to basically teach myself. A, a whole set of brand new GCSE content was uh, was interesting. Um, so I did I did that for a couple of years, but I really did just miss working in the primary school. Um, I, d- I don't know what what it was, and, and I could have stayed there. I, you know, it wasn't it, it wasn't too far away, and the opportunity was there to do lots of different things. But I just kind of missed being a primary teacher. Um, and again, I found a few places. Um, again, work job, jobs in Wales are a bit like jobs in Liverpool. They they are hard to come by. Um, but if you get yourself known, if you, if you dip your toes in the water, if you, you know, if you do a maternity cover, for example, you do a good job, then the chances are that you're going to move on to something else. Um, so after, after a couple of pretty much, pretty much a couple of maternity covers, I've ended up where I am now. And I've been in my school for the last, this is my fourth year now at my current school. Um, and again, because of the 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 area that i'm kind of trained in the, the the immediate thing was to kind of put me in charge of music um there there is a there, there's a big shift in wales in terms of the new curriculum so you don't necessarily have um leaders for music and art and such like what what they do is they, they've now put things into um areas of learning so we kind of work as a team rather than individual people which is quite nice actually so so I'm part of a couple of people who work on um, the expressive arts. I, I take obviously more control of what happens in music, um, but in terms of the other expressive arts subjects, we, we kind of work together and look at different things like that. Um, and just as chance would have it, I, um, I ended up taking over maths. And um, maths is one of those really interesting ones for me because um, I find it fascinating. Now, now that I'm older, and I understand it a bit more. Um, I find maths absolutely fascinating i love things like logic and problem solving and puzzles and things. that that aspect of maths and numeracy is really really great i really love that and i love teaching and um, problem solving it's, it's probably one of the the most fun things that i like to teach um but i'm you know anyone who knows me from growing up would probably be surprised by me saying that because i am um, i failed my maths mock exam uh catastrophically like literally got like nothing 
absolutely nothing. But it did. T- it told me a few things. It told me one, I probably just needed to work harder um, because I, I sat down and I, re- I revised for that and I revised for that and I passed. I think I got a B in the end, um, which isn't too bad a grade at GCSE. I know it's not, you know, flying, but I went from failing massively to to, to getting a B, which is which is all right. Um, but also, actually, it kind of drives a lot of what I feel not to do when teaching. Because I remember a lot, most of my teaching, with the exception of very practical subjects, because um, even music in my school was literally sit behind a desk and get talked at for an hour. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't learn very well like that. Um, and basically the expectation is that we get told, of, uh, funny enough, listening to, to Shannon's podcast, uh, uh, interview and where she's talking about um lots of modeling and lots of um you know repetition and just making sure that people um you know understand what it is they're doing whereas i was very much i'm going to show you how to do this and then you get on with it and i i can't do that so i i took a lot of what, how i was taught and kind of do do the opposite in a way because it, it kind of that kind of just leads drives a lot of what i do um, so yeah, so I um, just as chance would have it, the the opportunity to be a uh, maths coordinator came up in my school, and again, it's just been another really interesting thing, especially with the new curriculum coming in. Um, and I, I would also add on, I, I've kind of added to my remit in school side because we're, we're quite a small school; we don't have massive teams of people. Um, you know, I, you know, our deputy head has three or four individual roles which could easily be assigned to one person you know that's 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 the kind of system we're working with um so it is quite busy but because we've got the new curriculum coming in and because there's been a really big drive in um uh research and reading and Im- implementation of actual things that people have looked at rather than just things that you found online um so i've kind of taken on that mantle a little bit as well. So I, I kind of do a lot of reading and feeding back to school as well. Um, so I've, I find it really interesting listening to your other podcasts um, when people have been talking about curriculum and things that they think are important. Um, I know you, you, you've interviewed um, Neil Almond and I've, you know, I've, I've chatted with Neil before and I've seen him talk and I've, I've, you know, I've read his chapter. I've actually used his chapter from his research ed. Um, thing that he wrote um as as some evidence that i've put forward to staff and to governors as well because i think that that conversation needs to be had so so yeah that's where i am nice that's actually impact although it is 15 years so <laughs> yeah will. do you know when 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 you asked that question i uh <laughs> i started counting i was going oh, i've worked here and i've done this and i've been here and i've done that because i you know i i I forget how old I am sometimes and i forget how long i've, I've been doing the job because i i literally went straight from school to university, to PGC, and straight back into school. You know, I've never known any different. It's 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 what I've done, and you know. But like I said before, I've been doing it for this long, and I will still happily listen to people who've been teaching for four or five years because that's what their level of expertise is. You know, um, and 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 I, you know, I said before, I will always ask if I'm not sure of something. You know, I, I don't claim to be an expert in every single subject because I don't think I don't think you can be, and I don't think you should be either. I, I, I don't think you should be that necessarily that one person who knows absolutely everything because I think it's an impossible task. I do think it's an impossible task. So if I need help with something, I'll ask. Yeah, because they, they say that like Isaac Newton was the last person to know everything about science that man could, you know, because there, there is just too much information, at the, you know, in existence right now. Um, you know, and I think even when I think about my own relative expertise in mathematics, I still yeah. think... I know half as much as I would like to, you know, so yeah, it's really hard to quantify that. And, um, you know, I, and I think it is in relation to, you know, whoever your, your conversations with and um, a, lot, a lot of stuff came up there that um, was familiar. You know, I, I moved to the Southeast of England because I suppose my impression of Northern Ireland at the time was that once you got to teach a job, that was a job for life. And I, yeah. know, I think it might still be that way. Yeah. But I think one of the things that stood out was you saying about being lazy and in terms of not doing the plan and just focusing on your teaching but i actually think that is how we should be training our least experienced teachers you know so yeah you know, i'm a big fan of high quality textbooks it comes up quite a lot on this podcast yeah basically that that's taking a lot of the burden of having to think about what i'm going to teach 
so you can focus 100% on high equity. So that's how we got a future. Yeah. I don't think you're being lazy at all. And I think actually that's optimum conditions for, you know, someone's professional development. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so obviously, as a very talented music specialist, you're extremely passionate about the quality music education in primary. Um, and so my question is, why is music education important or perhaps essential at the primary level? Um, so when I, whenever, I, whenever I talk about music or whenever I go anywhere or write anything, I put a PowerPoint presentation together. I always start, it's, it's, it is a little bit cheesy um, and it's getting a little bit old fashioned, but there, there's a, um, there's a, I'm not sure you could class it as a meme necessarily, but there's, there's, a, there's an image you can find online and it talks about all the different aspects of what music actually is beyond music. So, you know, they, they, you, know you can delve really deeply into what music is, you know, music is mathematical um I, I did a talk for broad cymru on some aspects of how music and math link together on a really basic level as well i'm not talking complex mathematics i'm talking kind of useful math that you can use in the classroom you know it's very mathematical there's a lot of language involved in in music it's not just necessarily about listening to sounds there's, there's a lot you can gain from listening to lyrics um or listening or looking at you know the background of some of the terms and terminology that are used in in music um, it can be very scientific. Um, it's it, it's also very physical. If you've ever taken part in a in a really solid music lesson, if you're, if you're singing and joining in with something, um, it can be very very physical. Um, it, it is an art form, um, which means that people have got an opportunity to express themselves in a way that is important to them. Um, and I think that's what people um, miss a little bit in terms of what music is, is that we kind of compare music teaching in primary schools with what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, if that makes sense. So, you know, we're surrounded by music and sound on a day-to-day -day basis. You just got to look at what people are experiencing and, and um, kind of consuming on things like social media, uh, particularly things like TikTok and Instagram are filled with songs. But the problem is that you compare what happens in school with that and it doesn't necessarily match up whereas um a really kind of kind of quiet i said it sounds, it sounds really random that a quiet music lesson <laughs> i'm not sure how, how that works but um but a, a music lesson which is kind of just thoughtful and allows people to kind of just um show who they are and what kind of sound they want to make i think is really important um and it's not about producing the next uh, number one hit it's just about having the opportunity to to take a kind of starting point and kind of just do something that kind of means something to you like any like like any of the arts if i'm honest um you know the, there should never really be any right or wrong answers which i i quite like that about music you know every single time you do um you do a composition task for example you could give one class one kind of starting point and what they produce will be completely different to what someone does the year after or the year after that or or even 10 years after that or even the next day and that's what i like is it's totally um uh free of really any kind of um constriction but what i also think about music particularly in primary school is it's a real leveler of a subject um you kind of when, when i used to like the old national curriculum um documentation because it was literally like a page long <laughs> it basically said you need to do some of this and these are your levels off you go um, whereas you know if you, if you compare it to something like you know something like mathematics or um literacy you're very they're very rigid in what you have to aim for whereas with music it's kind of like oh you know go for it see what happens and it allows all people and all children to get involved in some way um, e even if it's just a case of you give them a stick and they have to hit something with it because that's what they can do, then fine, that's what they can do. Whereas you'll get some people who will sing or some people who will pick up other instruments. And it's not, it, none of it is based on prior ability in anything else. And this is something I found quite frustrating teaching in, um, in a secondary setting, for example, is some, some schools will set for, particularly for, for core subjects, so, so literacy and numeracy, um, and then maybe go into mixed ability groups for things like music, which I quite like. I like mixed ability for music because you find that those pupils who are necessarily strong in other things aren't actually necessarily as capable or any better 
than someone who really struggles with maths or, or literacy. And actually, you might find that those people who, who are struggling elsewhere actually have a really great opportunity to shine in music, you know? And, you know, I've, I've got a little girl in my class right now who, um, who really, really um, struggles with a lot of things. And, and she's got a lot going on. I'm not going to go into the details, but she will happily, if I'm sharing something, we do news or something, she will stand up and she will sing a song for the class. And I just think having that outlet for your feelings is really, really important and giving children that opportunity to, 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 to make those sounds and, and it not being, it not being recorded necessarily. You're not sitting there with a, with a, with a, with an iPad filming them every second of every single thing they do. You just say, right, here's your, here's your input, make some sound, make something for me and then see how it goes and see what you come up with. You know, it's, 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 it's very abstract. Actually, a lot of primary music can be, um, and I think that's, uh, and again, I'll talk about this later on because I think that's something that, that scares teachers when it comes to primary music is, is they're, they're worried about things sounding bad, whereas actually they're not focusing on the fact that it's a really lovely outlet for people just for 45 minutes or an hour just to make noise and just feel like they're not being watched all the time. And I know there's, there's a lot of movement in, in education, you know, to, to, to being to less kind of rigid um, assessment but you, you know, you always have to be watching and paying attention to what's going on. But mu music lessons in particular just seem to be a little bit more free of that, those constraints, um, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite instruments in the world, actually, is, um, is the boom whacker. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across boom whackers. They are. Um, they it's are. Uh, Australian. <laughs> I, I, it's funny enough, they do sound Australian. And, and there's, there, do you know what? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of movement in Australia um, in terms of primary music education actually um you'll find quite a bit of uh, of research and, and lots going on over in the southern hemisphere but yeah boom whackers um and people who are listening to this who've ever played with a boom whack will know exactly what i'm talking about but basically literally they're just tubes but they are colored to match certain pitches and they are cut at different lengths so that when you hit it against something it plays that particular note and you know, I was talking about the immediacy of being able to create something. You can give a kid this massive tube and say, go and hit the floor. So they'll hit the floor and they'll create a perfect C or a perfect E. I say, well, well, you two, why don't you hit the floor at the same time? And all of a sudden you start creating harmonies. And, and that takes nothing. It takes no ability. It takes no pre anything. You're just giving them a tube and saying, hit the floor. And that's what I really like about it is it, it's, it's, it's accessible to pretty much everybody straight away you know you, you don't i mean yes there's a lot of theory that goes on in music and you can spend time talking about that but you can also spend a lot of time just giving things out and saying explore you know there's, there's a lot of exploration in music as well and that, you know that's how even um very well-paid composers find things out they explore they you know they don't sit down immediately at the piano and, and compose something which is perfect I know there are people that can do that, but, you know, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100 even, it doesn't work like that. You know, you have to spend some time just pressing buttons and filling. And I'm sure lots of people listening will remember the time when they were, particularly in secondary school, where you had the keyboards and you would sit there cycling through all of the different sounds you could make. And it was great fun. And you get to the DJ sound. It goes, DJ, DJ, and you love it. But actually what you're doing is you're exploring the sounds. And, you know, I've said it a few times, already, but that's what I like about it is it's it's very immediate. The The... The result is is straight away, you know, and and the, the initial result might not be brilliant, but after a period of, of refining and working and teaching, you then get even better results. But as a starting point, you know, you, you can't go far wrong with everybody in your class having something in their hands and just making this out. And even then, you know, there's you can you can buy books on using body percussion. Everybody everybody's got um, you know, everybody can make it some sort of sound. Um, you know, everybody can use them use their voices if they can um I, I say everybody that's that's a little bit broad but you know people are able to create some sort of sound using something that they have you know you don't even have to have that um and again i, I said before about um some teachers being a little bit put off or scared by things not sounding good but actually you need to make bad noises to to find out what actually works um and i remember i remember i did a um uh, a, a training session with um, Only Man Allowed, the the choral group from Wales. They, they sent a few people into school, and honestly, the, the warm ups they were getting us to do were hilarious, but they were they were quite liberating as well. They were you know you were making these ridiculous, stupid sounds, 
but it was quite fun. It was quite fun wandering around the hall, just making these weird and wonderful noises with everybody else. And once you get out of, you know, you, you get past that embarrassment of making funny noises, actually, again, it becomes, um, it becomes really enjoyable. So yeah, I think that's, that's, that's where I am. It's a, it's a really accessible subject for everybody, but it's, it's also an opportunity for anybody to be able to express kind of how they're feeling at any particular point. You know, my, I, I, I'm quite fortunate in that I can sit down at a piano and play some stuff. I'm not, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination, uh, a maestro, but I, I'm, I'm quite fortunate. I can sit down and play a few things. And my head teacher will always come in, walk through the hall and she'll say, I, I know how you're feeling today because you can tell what I'm playing, you know, and it'll, and it'll change over time. And that's quite nice as you can tell how people are kind of by how they kind of approach a task. You know, the kids who are feeling really happy and energized when they've got a boom whacker will run around hitting loads of things and making loads of noise. And the others who maybe aren't feeling that way might just sit in the corner and, and tap it, but they're still making music. They're still making sound. So accessibility, I think is, is key. Nice. Um, I think I, I would classify myself as someone who absolutely loves music you know, listens, learns about as much as possible. Um, but will admit that I never managed to fit in as much time as I would have liked whenever I was teaching, you know, full thing of um, a full suite of subjects. But I think you've made a very convincing case as to why we should. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about the focus that mental health has at the moment, you know, particularly yeah. at this very moment. Um, and But we've got this mode of expression and... To, you know, both in playing and in listening, that actually yeah. existed for millennia. Um, so actually, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel; just give the the kids the tools. And um, I've definitely seen those boom whackers before. I'd never heard the name; they were just in the music cupboard. And um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. If if you get a chance to, and anyone anyone listening, just go onto YouTube and type in boom whackers and you'll see some amazing performances of um particularly percussion groups you know people like um i'm not sure if you remember stomp they were quite big um kind of 10 15 years ago and they, and they they created a lot of music using things like basketballs and water drums and things things that weren't necessarily classed as musical instruments um and actually going back to I, i've seen a few people teaching lessons using um things like tennis balls and basketballs you have to bounce the ball in time you have to throw the ball in time and catch the ball in time um which is which is great fun um and if you, you know you, you don't have to look very far to find people making it actually really quite um advanced and technical music using things that are just everyday objects and there's another group and for the life of me i apologize i can't remember the name of them but they um they perform songs on youtube using tuned bottles and and again it's 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 something to behold because it's so impressive to the point where they've actually worked out how to tune multiple bottles and play two bottles at the same time to create harmonies and this, you know it's not just a party trick anymore it's gone beyond being a party trick to being something that's actually really impressive um so yeah um but yeah just having that opportunity to make to make sound and um, but boom whackers are great fun you just hit them and they're great yeah, like, like you said, given access to pitch straight away. You know, you don't need to tune anything. You know, nope. you're, you're making you're making some harmonic sounds. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Um, and I suppose my next question is, if you had to condense your approach, and I think you've already gone quite a ways to doing this, if, if you could condense your approach to the teaching of music to a set of guiding principles, what, what would they be? Um, I think apart from... Apart from just letting people explore, that's quite important. You know, children need the, the opportunity to explore things. Um, I would probably say, first of all, don't don't be afraid of things sounding. I'm going to use in uh, inverted commas bad. There is no such thing as as bad sound. I mean, you can you can interpret something as being a bad sound, and you can discuss why you think it is a bad sound. But actually, what this comes down to is even just, um, you know, you know, the first question, one of the first questions you asked me, trying to make a judgment on albums. It just comes down to personal preference. What one person thinks is a is an awful sound or an awful song, or an awful album. Actually, somebody else will think is actually the best thing they've ever heard, you know, and it, a little bit of it, if I'm being honest, comes from snobbery. People are people can be really, really um, uptight about music when, when it comes to personal preference, um, and I'm not afraid to say that. Um, 
but you know everyone is entitled to their personal preference of music absolutely you know if you look at my spotify playlist it'll be very very different to yours for example or different to somebody else who's listening today and that you are absolutely allowed that that's one of the great things about art is it gives you so much choice in terms of what you access and what you what you consume um but i think people need to not be afraid of things sounding like and again this this is something that my uh uh, my teacher taught, said in um in when we were doing GCSE, you know, when I was 15, 16, and he, we, he said, I'm gonna play you this, but it just sounds like pots and pans. But actually, to the person who created that, it, it meant something more. You know, it was yeah, all right, it might have sounded to you, you, your interpretation was it sounds like pots and pans, but what that person was doing was they were producing something that was meaningful to them. So I think people need to be less afraid of creating things that to them may just sound like noise, which actually to the child is something which might be quite expressive. So don't be afraid of that. Um, um, the other thing I would probably say is you need to be confident. You have to go in and be confident. Um, if children see you panicked about something, then straight away, it's going to be really difficult to get them on site. And I, I appreciate that. You, you know, there will be lots of people listening going, well, I, I can't sing or I can't play an instrument. But actually, you don't have to be able to sing or play an instrument. If you can press play on a computer, then you can, you can lead a singing lesson. You know, you can, you can guide children in singing and, and learn with them, you know. But if you go in and go, oh, right, I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's not going to come, come across very well. The children pick up on that. And, you know, people will say that about, you know it's not new in teaching you know if you go into a classroom and you're negative about something or even you just go in with, with showing the, the wrong frame of mind um then it's going to rub off and it's not going to be a good session whereas if you go in and you and i'm not saying you have to be that children's tv presenter you don't have to go in with banners waving and clapping your hands and dancing around it's, it's not about that it's about just going and saying right we are doing this and it's going to be awesome okay and you know, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. But that's what happens in music. That you don't have professional music who walk on musicians who walk onto a stage and are immediately perfect. They spend hours and hours and hours practicing and rehearsing and refining. Okay, we, you know, it's that that classic iceberg. You know, that image you see success at the top, and actually underneath it, there are hours and hours and hours of torment and practice and getting things wrong. And you know, you need to have that dialogue with the kids as well. You know, you say, like, let's give it a go and see what happens. And if it goes wrong, it, go, it goes wrong. We'll look at where it went wrong and, and get it better. Just like you do with pretty much anything else in school. Um, you know, if you, if you do a piece of writing, for example, you say, well, let's, have, let's analyze our writing that we've done. Let's see where we can improve it. You can do exactly the same for a song. Um, so you've got to be, uh, you've got to be confident. You have to, you have to be positive and confident. But I, you know, I would add as a, as a caveat to that is sometimes that does mean you might need to do some practice. You know, I, I won't walk in, you know, I, I run um, on a Monday, first thing on a Monday morning, we do our um, singing assembly. It's, it's the best time to do it. First thing, nine o'clock, here we go, right, we're going to start our week with some singing. But I very much have moved away from click and play and sing along with the words on screen because I can. Um, and again, I'll talk about this in a little, it, it comes up a little bit later. Um, so I, you know, I, I can sit down and play the piano but i can't sit down and read the music straight away so i might have sat down on a sunday for an hour and practiced just so i know that i'm confident going in and and showing the children what it can be and and i'm more than happy you know my next my, my next point which follows on is you know own your mistakes be 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 happy to make mistakes you know don't go well, i say don't you can't make people do this but try not to go bright pink and cry in a corner because you made a mistake um because everybody does make mistakes. You know, I, I've, I've been to professional concerts that I've paid for where people have made mistakes. You know, I've, I remember going to see the, I remember going to see the Lion King on the, on the, um, on the West End. You know, this, that's a proper professional performance. And halfway through one of the scenes, they literally stopped everything. They took all the actors off and a little tannoy came over saying, such and such has happened. Uh, we've had a technical issue. We'll get it fixed as soon as we can. And then they carried on. And no one batted an eyelid. They, they weren't bothered by it at all because these things happen. And you need to take that approach in, I think, in, in music lessons. If you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. If you sing a wrong note, it doesn't matter. If you get a word wrong. I'm, I'm the worst for it, actually. I get words wrong all the time, like permanently. I always get words wrong. Yeah, I'll be so happy to sing it away. And I'll suddenly start singing the wrong notes. And all the kids will start pointing out me going, what are you on about? It's supposed to be these. Um, 
and again, playing the piano in, in assembly in front of two, 300 kids. And, and I'll, you know, I'll play a wrong chord or something. And it, the, the whole thing doesn't descend into chaos. It's just, it's just a mistake that is, is brushed over. Um, you know, I, I, I could tell you a story. I was, um, I was playing the national anthem. I was playing the Welsh national anthem for a prize giving. All right? It was my first year at this school. And um, it, was, it was one of the first years I'd actually lived in Wales. So I didn't really know the national anthem very well. So I thought, right, I'm going to have to do some practice. I had a, I had a free period. And I, uh, so I sat down. I, look, I looked it up because what I tend to do is I look up the melody and I look at the chords and I kind of busk from there. Um, so because for me, that works a little bit better. So I, I found the melody and I found the chords. I was like, right, the Welsh national anthem is in E flat. Here we go. So I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And I had this little scrap of paper with with the chords written on um and i practice and i practice and I practice all right so I, th- I think i could do this i think i think i can make this work um and i practiced with i had uh, i was doing a singing unit with with my year eight classes at the time so i thought oh, i'll practice with them we'll practice together so i know what i'm doing so then the night came the night came to to do some uh music for the for the prize given and this hall was massive i never really paid attention to how big the hall was until it was filled with people it was filled with all people who you know won awards there was some quite important like the mayor was there it was all sorts of right like, quite important people in the school all right right again here we go so we get to the we get to the end and we need to do the kind of the round of and play and, and do the, the the national anthem so i sit down and i open the piano and i go right where's my bit of paper and my bit of paper was nowhere to be seen and there was no way, because of where the piano was, there was no physical way of me getting from the piano to the music department to find my piece of paper to get back in time. Because they were literally standing up waiting for me to start playing. I was like, right, I just have to wing this and see what happens and go for it. So I started playing. So I played the introduction and, and, I, and, it, and it, was, it, it was right. <laughs> People started singing when I started playing. I was like, oh, brilliant. This is going really well. So I'm playing the national anthem. Okay, here we go. We're getting there. And then we get to the chorus. I go, oh, here we go. So I did a really big rousing rumble on the piano. I played a massive... Uh, chord and everyone's singing they're going really wild you know if you've, if you've ever watched um, Welsh people at the rugby for example singing the national anthem you know they they love it they go they go absolutely wild for it we're going brilliant and then we get to the final little bit do 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 and it was brilliant so I thought well, do you know what I'm going to do a second chorus I'm going to go again I'm going to do it again so I went again <laughs> and they were there they're going Rah, really loud and, and it was brilliant I felt great and then we got to the end and I don't know what came over me but I got to the end, it went, do, 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 do. and then all I needed to do was play an E flat chord. And do you think I played an E flat chord? No, I did not. I couldn't even tell you what I played. It was, it was something totally random, right? I think there was an E flat in it somewhere, but it wasn't an E flat chord. So I played this chord and it sounded like this really in kind of alternative jazz chord I'm going to go with. It was something like that. <laughs> and you could see, <laughs> one of the other music teachers standing next to me and he just looked at me he was like what on earth what, what are you doing and the, the, the head of the department for the performing arts was there looking at me and the front row of people kind of were looking at each other going what what was this and then I played an E flat chord and stopped and everyone was kind of looking around going okay that kind of that kind of worked <laughs> uh-huh. but even you know but that, the, the point of that is that You've just got to own your mistakes. You've just got to go with it. And that's what I quite like about music stuff is that particularly in primary schools, you, you, you know, kids are going to make mistakes left, right and center. And you've just got to kind of go with it and enjoy that, those kind of moments. Because that for me is possibly one of the, the best story. I've got, I mean, I've got, I'm quite fortunate that, you know, I, as a musician, I've had a lot of opportunity to do, to do stuff like that. And, you know, the, having rehearsals where you've got squirrels running through the hall and all chaos you know breaks loose um but yeah and and it's the same in in singing assemblies you know you have a singing assembly where you know you might not have practiced enough or something's happened and as long as you kind of you know honest you go well do you know what i made that mistake it doesn't matter because that that actually filters really nicely into your lessons because you take that that kind of um you take that viewpoint with you and you make a mistake or the kids make a mistake and say well do you know what you've seen me make mistakes i you know and i i'm 
30 years older than you, you know? I, I still make mistakes when I'm playing for everybody, so it doesn't matter at all, you know? All right, when we come to record it, we might need to do it again to get it right, but it, it, it's not the end of the world. So, yeah, I would, I would say absolutely own, own your mistakes and, and be honest about the fact that people make mistakes, you know? Even people who've been doing it for most of their lives who are paid to do it still make mistakes. I think that's really, really important. I am. So, yeah. Um... I'm re- I'm really glad you played the flat because then um, the thought of a whole room of people with that sense of dissatisfaction inside that the, the, the oh yeah <laughs> you didn't, you didn't complete the, the phrase um yeah <laughs> sometimes I'll, I'll intentionally listen to the end of psalms just so I can get to the you know the the conclusion yeah <laughs> um, but yeah hundred percent and I mean I'm thinking about maths lessons when you're talking about these music and I think that'll be really helpful to newer teachers because. Singing is something that I'm not a fan of doing in front of other people. But yeah. like you say, knowing that it's okay to make mistakes, no one's expected to be perfect, you know, try and throw yourself into that situation early on in your career. Um, and then it gets easier as time goes on, you know. But yeah. e- equally, like I always say, you know, if you're going to give kids a maths problem, do the maths first, you know. It'd be something similar with, you know, prepping for a music yeah. lesson. And equally, if you make a mistake in a lesson, you've got two choices. You can either pretend it's intentional or <laughs> you can ask them to explain why it's wrong. You know, and yeah. you know, it's never a case of, well, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. It might feel like it, you know, but sometimes we're, we're thinking about six or seven different things at the same time. Yeah. You're not going to be perfect. And um, so, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on board with those. And, um, you know, I think they, they generalize, but in terms of music, you know, where people do get nervous quite a bit um, yeah. and that's going to be, you know, it's absolutely solid advice um, for a lot of people. And, I, and you know what? I, I still get nervous. You know, I've, I've been performing for years and years and years. And like you know, I, I said before, I've, I've performed on TV, I've performed on the radio, and there's not a time where I don't get nervous, you know? But again, it's just kind of one of those life things that happens, you know? It's not, it's, it's a rare thing to have people that don't get nervous, you know, even, even absolute pros. Um, in any field, to be honest with you, if, you, if, if they're going out to do something that's important, then you, you're going to get nervous. And the one other thing I would say um, is, like you said about doing, you know, making sure that you do the math first so you know what it is that you're kind of aiming for. But, but also joining in. Joining in is really important. Um, I think, and like, like you said, you know, not everybody's a confident singer. And, and you know, it took me a long time. I was, I was never a singer to begin with. I think as I've gotten older, and I've kind of grown into my voice a little bit. Um, and that's a really important actually thing to, to talk about with, with young people is that voices are different and voices change. And that's why sometimes you might find singing difficult. Because I, I, I remember vividly um, not getting into my school choir. We had, to, um, we had to audition when we were in year seven, year eight, I think it was, for the, for the school chapel choir it was. And we had to sing once in Royal David City. You know, anyone who knows that song will know it is very high and actually very hard. That opening, that opening stanza is very, very difficult. And, and, and it was a real big knock for me. So I, I didn't sing for a long old time. Um, I actually didn't, I don't think I really started singing again until I started teaching. Um, and a lot of that was kind of being thrown in the deep end and saying, do you know what? If you're asking the kids to do it, you need to do it as well. You know, you can't just sit at the back and press, press play and kick back and marks and bucks. You need, you need to, you need to be there working. You know, I, I, I once got told by a head who came to observe a lesson saying that I was working too hard. I was like, well, do you know what? I, I was actually enjoying myself. <laughs> I was playing the piano. I was singing with the kids. We were, you know, we were, we were just enjoying the lesson. You know, he was like, well, you should have given them time to go off and do something. I was like, well, no, because we were enjoying singing. We were learning. We were talking about singing, you know? And, and I get some, some sessions can be very, very teacher heavy. You know, if you stand up in front of a class of eight year olds for an hour and talk at them, then yeah, you're working too hard and you're not, you're not doing your job properly. But you know, if, if people are enjoying what you're doing and you're enjoying what you're doing, then I, I can't see that being a bad thing as long as you are joining in. And, like, and, and even like I said, in, in any subject, you know, like math or English or geography or history, you know, you join in with the lesson. You, you go, oh, look at this. I, you know what? I didn't know that. I've learned something today. One of the kids goes off and does some research and tells you something. Oh, I've, I've actually learned, you know? And there's always that moment. There's always that, that, that joining in. And kids, I think, sorry, I shouldn't really use the word kids. Pupils and young people um, really appreciate it when you join in. They don't like being given stuff and just being left to it. You know, they like to see you joining in. I, 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 I always use myself as an example as well. I always say to my kids, um, because, um, you know, I, I grew up in England, but I, I'm 
living and working in Wales. So I have to teach Welsh and I find it hard. And, and I say to the, I say to the children, do you know what? I'm learning this with you pretty much. <laughs> I've maybe, I'm maybe like one step ahead of you in, in some cases, you know, I, I learned this yesterday. I reminded myself yesterday, there's nothing worse than coming back to school in September and going, right, I need to speak Welsh again. <laughs> and I haven't spoken the language for nearly two months. And I'm like, right, okay, here we go. So I have to relearn it. You have to put the effort in. And, but again, it comes down to that kind of owning your mistakes and being honest with the kids and saying, right, let's see where we get. <laughs> let's see how we get. And, and, and I might tell them something and go, oh, do you know what? I actually might be wrong with that. Let's let's just look that up again. Let's look that word up and let's look that phrase up again. Let's double check that spelling. Um, and, and again, it comes back to what I said before is, you know, we can't be perfect at absolutely everything. There's always something that we need to work at. Um, and for, for a lot of people, you know, that is the arts, that is music. And, you know, having to put in that extra half hour just to listen to that song or watch that YouTube video, just to make sure that you know what you're doing, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, in your opinion, what's the single most important aspect of music, music education? <laughs> so I know, I know I said before that um, the album question was probably the most impossibly difficult question. I think this is really hard and you, you, people will argue over this forever. Um, I, I've, I'm going to try and narrow it down to 900 different aspects. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I think personally for me, when I, whenever I start working with a new class in particular, the, the first thing I kind of delve into is what their sense of pulse is, what their, what, how they feel music. Um, because I think if you're going to ask pupils to um, perform, if you're going to ask pupils to um, compose and perform their own music without your guidance, they need to have a really good, um, internal feeling for music. So I could put a piece of music on and it could be absolutely anything. Um, it could be classical, it could be R&B, it could be rock, it could be a film score, it could be something, you know, totally obscure. And if they can really kind of feel the pulse of music and clap along with it or tap along and join in with the music, I know that we're onto a winner because we can do some really good quality things. Whereas if you've got groups of people who are just flapping and clapping however they want because they just haven't got that inbuilt kind of feeling for music and some people do struggle some people do struggle to keep time with things and that's a natural thing you know it's, it's again not everybody is capable of being perfectly in time it's the same as not everybody has perfect pitch perfect pitch is quite a rare thing to be honest with you um but you can learn to to stay in time with things and again that starts right down uh, in the nursery you know singing singing nursery rhymes together and singing along with each other and doing that regularly and just have, having that inbuilt kind of feeling for music i think that that is probably for me the single most important thing because it allows you to access lots more um, in terms of performing. You know, you feel like you can kind of get on board with a song or sing and perform more complicated things because you, 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 you get how the music feels, especially when you start getting older um, and you start wanting to sing, for example, pop songs. You know, I, I said, I mentioned earlier on that we, we tend to, um, we tend to base our judgments on things on what, um, we hear the most of, and a lot of what our children are listening to at the minute is popular music. That's what they, that's what they consume. That's what they're hearing. And a lot of them want to sing these songs without realizing actually just how complicated they are. They're very, very complex things. As, as much as people like to make a joke about some songs, actually popular music is some of the well, probably the most well-crafted music you will listen to. There's a, there's a reason why it's popular because it's good. You know, it's written really well. But when you've got people who are singing really complicated rhythms and really complicated mel melodic patterns, you need to have a really good understanding of how the music feels to be able to join in with that. You can't just sing it and it happens. Um, and I think that comes from that, that internalization of pulse. Can you feel how the music is, is happening? Um, and, and similarly, it opens up questions as well. Is it, is it a regular pulse? Is it irregular? Is this, is this time signature correct? Does it change? You know, and, and it opens up all sorts of, of avenues then because you can suddenly notice these subtleties in, in some of the songs that you're listening to that you might not have noticed before. Um, again, talking about popular music, I think the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a 0.5 to your question in terms of the single most important aspect is appreciating everything, like all music. Um, you know, if I, I, if I shared my, my Spotify playlist um, with you, you know, I, I've got a playlist, funny enough, I've got a playlist of sh sea shanties, 
um, from from way before they suddenly blew up because of social media, because things like sea shanties and, and folk music and particularly Irish. I love Irish folk music. And since moving to Wales, funny enough, I got, I've, I've started listening to a lot more Welsh folk music as well. Um, I really love that. But again, I, you know, I, I grew up, um, I'm of the, the generation that grew up with things like the super Nintendo and the mega drive and kind of early video games. So stuff like that interests me and in seeing what people are doing. So my, my, my Spotify is, is probably the most eclectic thing. Um, and you have to have it. You have to take that on board. The when when children come in, yes, lots of them will consume popular music through through whatever it is that they're seeing. But actually, a lot of children will come in. I've I've got a I've got a child that comes into into school wearing Metallica hoodies because that's what she listens to because her mum listens to it. It's great. It's brilliant. Um, and then you get other people who come in wearing or you know other band things, and you get people coming in with this, that, and the other. So I think it's that um, that wider appreciation that everything is uh, valued. Every, every aspect of music is valuable to somebody. Um, and like I said, going back to the, the, the pots and pans that I told you about before, someone has gone out of the way to create that. It's not, it's not just someone's fallen down the stairs and recorded and gone, hey, there's my music, you know? And, and it's having that, that, um, that inbuilt appreciation so you can put something on for someone for a class and that you don't have them sitting there giggling, going, oh, look at them, they're singing. Those men are singing high. Well, yeah, men do sing high. Let's right, let's play a, a, a song by John Legend. Listen to how high he's singing. You're going to laugh at him. No, well, why not? So it's having that, you know, making sure that you have that kind of respect for everything that's, that's, that's created. But yeah, that, that was that was my 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 point five. I think overall, if you can develop a really strong sense of pulse and feeling for music, you you can then go on to appreciate the craft of pretty much any other music that you listen to. So that's, that's a great answer. Um, yeah, and I think um, Spotify over the years has really broadened the amount of music you can have access to. Yeah. Like um, at the minute in work, whenever I'm sort of really focused, I'll listen to like a, is it Rangas? Sort of like that Indian yeah. classic music, you know? Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that 10 years ago, but it, it, it's no. it's just totally different. So you can almost zone out completely. Um, whereas if you listen to stuff yeah. with lyrics and things, it's a different story, and yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. I think yeah, and definitely can learn, you know, and, and children do because I'm thinking about my own kids, and you know, not 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 clapping in time when they're maybe one, two years old, but by the time they're yeah. four or five, you know, they, they've had that practice, you know, and then you can do so much more, you know, because I'm thinking back to when we're talking about um, playing instruments ourselves and things, you know, a lot of the time you'll have a, a sense of where the the root of the of the key is and then you just sort of go with the flow don't you and yeah and uh, yeah so you're almost opening those doors and yeah kids to do that you know down the line yeah that's but, it, but it takes practice it's, it's it, again without unless you are very fortunate to be someone that just gets it, it it does take practice you know it does take a lot of practice um so talking about spotify um and I know Spotify are a little bit questionable in terms of how much money they, they give to artists, but in terms of broadening horizons, in terms of what you can access, it's brilliant. Um, we actually run a thing, I'm talking about appreciating music. Um, one of the things I introduced as part of our um, music assemblies, our singing assemblies, was every class gets an artist of the week. And I have a bank of about 50 artists from across genres, from all sorts of things. And some of them people will have heard of, some of them they won't have heard of. And basically what they do is they, they send their helper up on a Monday and they, they, they take a random card out of the box and then they take it back to the class. And then that week, that teacher can listen to music by that particular artist and they can do it however they want. They can do it while kids are working. They can do it. Um, I, I quite like to find, find a 15 minute period, you know, that maybe that 15 minutes prior to, to lunch or something like that, where you kind of wrap, you wrap things up and everyone's kind of like, oh, we've finished a bit earlier. What, what do we do? So I fill that time in with listening to our artists of the week. And again, that, that just through that simple act has actually really broadened how much music was consumed in my school, like, like immediately overnight. It, it, like, so, um, and again, you weren't necessarily just having to have people asking, oh, can we listen to this? Because that's what I like. You were playing things to them and, people were finding actually they were enjoying it because it was something they'd not heard before or they were they were making that because one of them one of the artists i put in there was a uh, Hans zimmer 
I'm a massive Hans Zimmer fan. Um, have been for a very, very long time. I think actually as his work's gone on the last 10 or 15 years, he's got even better because he's kind of branched out, you know, early, early, early Hans Zimmer 2000s kind of, you can almost tell that it's his work because you can almost hear it, the same themes popping up in films. But then he kind of started branching out. He, he wrote the music for, um, for Planet Earth 2. I think it was, or Blue Planet 2, sorry. And that, if you get a chance to listen to an album, that is absolutely outstanding music. It is unbelievable. But, you know, people were listening to it going, oh, I didn't realise it was this person, and that's what their name is. I've heard this before, and, and I like it. It's something that I've, you know, or, pl- or giving them, um, um, Brian Tyler's another one. Brian Tyler is a film composer, but he does really great um, kind of, uh, fusions between kind of really heavy rock music with orchestral music and it's just it's brilliant this is great action music and people are listening listening going this is awesome stuff how have i never heard this before i say well you probably have you just haven't noticed before or you didn't know what the name of this person is so yeah just through that simple act of of <laughs> it sounds awful but almost forcing people to listen to different types of music has has really broadened the kind of horizons of, of what people listen to and because there's so many artists as well and one of the rules is you're not allowed to have the same artists as you've had previously um you're never going to get the same artist twice in a year because there's more than the 39 teaching weeks worth there's, there's over 50 in there and depending on which teacher you give them to depends on how they will consume it as well so one person will listen to say, like I know one of our teachers, for example, is a massive take that fan and take that is in there. Um, so if you give her the, the take that one, you know that she's going to be listening to their entire back catalog of stuff. Whereas someone else might listen to one or two of their maybe newer songs or something like that. So they're getting a different, different viewpoint of things as well. So that's, it's a really nice thing to do that. Actually. I re- I, that's one of the things I miss actually be, being, being um, working from home and not doing that. Um, on a weekly basis is something I'm really missing um, because that was, it was actually a real highlight because, and, and it got to the point once the pupils kind of um, got over the shock of suddenly having to sit and listen to, um, you know, Weber and 12 tone um, contemporary music, they start asking to listen to it and start asking, Oh, who's our, oh, can we listen to artists of the week, please? Um, the, the only, the only aside to that is you do have to be careful Um and, and making sure that because some, some, for example, you know, being in Wales, the stereophonics are on there, but you know, please be careful with the songs that you <laughs> that you play. And and again, this this comes this comes down to what I said before. You know, you do need to spend a couple of seconds just just making sure you know what it is you're putting. Now, Spotify does have a good filter. They've got an explicit language filter, and um, so you can take things out. And this this is something else that, um, and I, I know I'm kind of sidetracking slightly. But this is something else that does concern me slightly about music consumption. Um, as an example, you know, um. My, my daughter likes to play um, Just Dance, which is a great game. And I know people sometimes put them on, um, if you're kind of covering for half an hour and put Just Dance YouTube videos on, you know, the kids love dancing along with them. But they purposely take out a lot, or they take out any explicit language from them. So then you find that song on Spotify. And again, you know, annoyingly, my kids have kind of figured out how to ask for things on Spotify. They'll put these songs on and kind of un- unwittingly because they've heard them from somewhere else. And all of a sudden you're hearing this, this really explicit language. So you do have to be very, very careful um, in that respect. But that, that's kind of the nature of the world we live in generally with anything that we consume. Um, you know, the, even if you're looking for a video on history, for example, and you watch it on YouTube, if you don't pay attention to it. All of a sudden something might pop up which maybe you don't actually want to be sharing with your classes. Uh, you know, there is always that danger, but yeah, that's just a, just a nice thing. Just having a, having an artist of the week, which is totally randomly chosen has, has, has made a massive difference in terms of, of music appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a superb idea. And um, one I'm definitely going to take back to my schools. Um, but I know what you mean about worrying about the lyrics and stuff. It, Cause whenever I do my time, it was rock star stuff. I spent yeah. a long time looking for instrumental versions that, haven't just reduced the vocals down, you know. So if you put on a Green Day song from the mid '90s, there's a yeah. fair chance you're going to get a good few swear words and in, in, yeah. in order. <clears throat> um, and so it's you know spending time finding those those tracks that you know you get the essence of the music, but you don't get um, you know you don't get the sort of the the negative I suppose negative side of yeah primary you know, kids. Um, you know, but it, but again, that's that that's all about. Um, yeah, you're right. It's not negative. Um, it's just 
it's it's not necessarily appropriate for the ages that you know you know as adults listening to music we have a very different understanding of what it is that we're listening to compared to compared to our young people so yeah uh, as far as prep work goes listening to music that's, that's not a bad thing <laughs> i know not at all <laughs> the pbs session um and so in what is it that schools should provide a stellar music offering what is it that they do so well um i think it all come i think it comes down to um consistency and regularity um you know not not doing things once in a blue moon because you've got to tick a box you know um i think um and, and keeping it simple, actually, not not being not trying to be over complicated. You know, when you break down actually what pupils need to know and be able to do in in primary music, it's not groundbreaking. It's you know, it's 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 basic skills. It's it's the kind of stuff where if you went to your local, you know, the the, the comp that your school feeds, for example, your feeder school. Um, and if you went around each department and you said, you know, what do you actually want them to know when they come up to school? When they come up to year seven, what do you want them to be able to do? Most of them will actually just say, please just teach them the basics. Just teach them the absolute basics. And if you get the basics right. So like I said before, having getting that really inherent sense of pulse and performance and, and you know, that, that ability to, to just join in and do things, I think is really important. But the only way you can do that is with regular sessions. Um, and so that's, that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we do a regular singing assembly. I'm not talking just singing a song at the start of, um, of the, the assembly, because every school does that. Everybody puts the words on the screen, press, pl presses play. The kids sing along with it. Oh, this is really great. And then you do your assembly. You tell a story or whatever. Whereas actually having a dedicated music assembly where I'm actually teaching them to breathe. I'm teaching them posture. I'm teaching them to sit up. And actually, I'm actually using that assembly time as a lesson. You know, I'm not just treating it as a let's get together and have a little chat about all these things that I want to tell you. I'm actually teaching them and moving on. Um, because... I am I am well aware. Um, I remember when I when I spoke at um, the the New Voices conference a co couple of years ago. Um, one of the things I did was I did a breakdown of my timetable, and I am massively aware that teachers across the land have such little time on their timetables. You know, when you break it down, when you take out your your, your literacy, your numeracy, your statutory PE that you have to do, you take out your science a week. Uh, you take out your computing, your ICT time that you've, 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 your slot is booked for. Um, it doesn't leave you with a great deal of time, you know, when you've still got to teach humanities, you've got to teach RE, history, geography, you've got to teach um, art and drama and dance and all these, you know, the, I, I'm well aware that, that teachers are um, short on time. But just finding that time, um, like I said, that 15 minutes before lunch, listening to something and talking about it in a musical way actually is quite useful. You know, we, we, do, we do a thing, there's a really big thing in Wales, um, which is um, called Slot Drillio. And basically the idea is literally 10 minutes, that's it, daily, where you just, you have a, you have a, a pattern for that week that you just need to practice. It's literally just asking a question, asking and answering, asking and answering, asking, and you do it every single day. And the, the payoff from that is massive because it's, it's that retrieval, that constant retrieval practice. And the same works for, for any subject, if I'm honest, um, and particularly in music. Um, and if you're not, playing music regularly and say oh what instruments that you can hear or what, what you know what what's the tempo like in this is it fast is it slow does it change just having those quick quick questions and actually they're really basic things if you if you know and and i know that this is where some teachers do fall down a little bit is that their subject knowledge is a little bit um lacking in terms of the elements of music but there is plenty of information out there to to have that um and even if you just focus on a a skill or a, a, a an element a term you know, and just regular revisiting of it. Um, I think that's where schools do well. And I, I, I know that there are some schools that can afford to buy in music specialists to teach their weekly music lesson, um, which is great. You know, that's, that's, that, that, if, if, if schools have got that, it's an amazing opportunity to really develop music because that's what music needs. It does need regular practice. It needs to be regular and consistent. Um, you know, I've, I've taken over a job as a as a uh, funny enough when i was an nqt my first ever job i remember walking in and one of the year nines just sat there brazenly looked at me and went you'll be here for about two weeks i reckon 
because they haven't had that regularity, that regular um, input of, of good quality teaching, they didn't see any value in it. Um, so if you're not regular, even just listening to music, then you're not going to, I don't think you're going to be able to provide, like you say, a stellar offering for music. Um, the other thing I would say, people that I think do well, and again, this is a really difficult one for me to say, but it is true, is investment. You know, school, schools that have got... Um, schools that have got a good set of resources available to them w- will naturally be able to provide a, a higher standard of, of, of uh, provision, you know? And it's, it's, it's really disheartening to see, you know, when schools don't have a budget for music at all because it's not there. It's not their fault. It's just not there at all because, you know, we've been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed budget-wise for, for, for decades now. It's not, it's not a new thing. It's been going on for a long, old time. you just got to look at the decline in music services and the fact that, you know, in England, I think I'm right in saying that they have music hubs now, which is basically where they pooled all their resources. But it's, you know, it sounds really great. And I know that people are, can access them from, in various forms but you've also got to think about why those hubs were put into place. And it's because other music services have closed down. You know, it's not, you know, I'm not painting over it. I'm not glossing over anything. Whereas people have probably lost jobs along the line because the money's not there for it, you know? Um, so, but yeah, it's the regularity and also use it using your, um, using your, um, sorry, using your specialists in school. You know, um, I guarantee someone who's got a bit of experience in playing an instrument when they were younger is probably going to have a, a really good time teaching musically than maybe someone who feels completely incapable of doing so. Um, and that's something we, we do sometimes in my school is every now and then I, w- I will, for example, go up to teach um, in year six. You know, like I've mentioned, you know, I, I'm working hard on Welsh, but sometimes I need someone to come down and really deliver some good quality teaching to those pupils so we swap around every now and then and there's nothing wrong with that i think i think primary schools who are set in their ways and this is my class and this is who i teach i think are uh, taking the wrong approach if i'm honest with you you know if you've got someone who is a good quality music teacher in your school why are you not using them it, it doesn't make sense and it doesn't have to be all the time i'm not saying every thursday between the hours of one and two you have to go to this class and they have to come to you i'm not saying that at all but you know if you've got a half term, for example, where, you know, do you know what? I've got a really nice music thing that fits with my topic really well, but I'd like someone to do a really good job of it. Then, you know, make those amendments. You know, it, it doesn't have to be complicated by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think regularity um, and using your specialists as best as possible. And this is not to take away from people who try to teach things. And again, I've used Welsh before as an example. I try to teach Welsh. I actually really enjoy it. I love languages. But like I said, sometimes I just need someone to come down and check what I'm doing and deliver some really killer stuff for these kids to really get on board with that I might not necessarily have the, the subject knowledge to be able to do. Um, I think the other thing that people offer, if they're offering a really good music curriculum, is it is um, it's modern and inclusive of all the kids that they've got. Um, I think people who still refer back to things that they did 30 years ago maybe need to have a look at uh, some of the things that they get. And I'm not saying that some songs that were written a long time ago are not relevant. However, sometimes you just want to get the kids involved. You just want to get them singing stuff that they, they, they recognize and they understand as well. Um, but by, but again, by being modern, I also mean things like technology as well. You know, we are living in a, the young people that we teach, I feel are so fortunate in terms of the technology they have around them. Um, you know, I remember being in primary school and we had a BBC basic computer. And it, you, could pro, you could program it to make some bleeps and bloops and flash up some words, but that was about it. You know, it wasn't, you know, the, we, we didn't have things like um, things like garage band on iPads that are just there. Um, I, I don't know if anyone listening has ever come across um, Chrome Music Lab before, which is a free thing made by Google. And it's probably one of my favorite teaching tools, to be honest with you, um, because you can do so much about it. You know, I, I've, I've written articles and blogs about using chrome music lab uh, for music for for math lessons for all sorts of different things and and you know these things have have suddenly appeared and if people aren't making use of them then you i i would say my advice would be to go out and start making use of them because they are so accessible and so quick you know long gone are the days of spending hours and hours trying to create something which sounds professional whereas actually you can do that 
almost immediately. And then the conversation then turns to, well, how can we make it better? Why does this work? You know, rather than spending time investigating sounds, you know, going back to the pressing the DJ button on the keyboard. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd probably say is people are kind of consistent and regular with their, with their music teaching and making use of the specialists and, and try, trying to be a bit more contemporary and up to date with some of the stuff that they're doing. Yeah, that's what I would say. Um, whenever people are answering, I always try to keep a, a track on, well, I'm going to ask about this, this and this. But so many high quality tips um, and pointers and advice <laughs> in here that um, I think it's impossible to, you know, I'll still have questions tomorrow. I'll be like, oh, I should have asked Andy that. Um, <laughs> can you send me the link for Chrome? Is it Chrome Music Lab? You know, yeah, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a bit of self-promotion later as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, and, and literally, if you go into Google and type in Chrome Music Lab, it's the first thing that comes up. It's, uh, there are loads of, and, and so, you know, some people listening now who've used it before will be nodding their heads going, oh, it is amazing. Uh, because it genuinely is. Um, because it's, Basically, what they've done is, is Google have created what they call little experiments. And each thing is just like a tiny little snippet. It's, it's, it's tiny. It's microscopic. You know, there's, there's one in there where there's just some strings and they're spread far a certain um, length apart. And when you click on the string, it, it, it shows you the waveform. So the lower ones have got nice long waveforms. As you get higher, they get quicker and quicker. And because they're quite scientific, the experiments as well, they show you actually the science and the visuals behind what's happening with the music. But it's also got um, little melody makers and little things where you can create patterns and melodies very, very quickly. It's almost, it's almost like a, an incredibly basic um, digital audio workspace, a DAW. And anyone who works with music production will know things like GarageBand, that's what that is. It's just a, a really simple, basic stepping stone. Um, one of my favorite things on there is called Kandinsky. Um, and this is what I was talking about really early on in terms of self-expression and art and just exploring and investigating so the kandinsky um, experiment is literally a blank page there's nothing on it and if you're on a tablet or you've got a, a, a mouse you just you click and you draw shapes and each shape makes a different sound and if you create a circle then it fills the circle in and puts some eyes on it and it sings for you or if you do lines or dots depending on where you put them it changes the pitch and the, the sound and the instrument and and it's fantastic because you can draw all sorts of fun pictures on it and it creates just these things and, and and it automatically makes sound based on what you've got and again it comes back to what i said before about people not being afraid to make things that sound what they would consider bad because wherever you put the marks on the screen it just plays them so there might not be any tempo or pulse to it but you're investigating the sound and the pitches based on where you put them that's one of my absolute favorite ones that because you literally start from nothing like absolutely nothing and you just mark make and those marks then are interpreted by the system as sounds which is absolutely fabulous it's amazing for early years who are you know investigating mark making the sound kind of association um so yeah that's a really great one i i i, I could i could talk for hours and hours and hours about chrome music lab on its own um one i um when i did my session for bread cymru i actually avoided talking about Chrome Music Lab because it my talk would have been ridiculously long. Um, I wrote an article, a couple of blogs for um, Nexus Education. Um, and it was literally about um, kind of cross-curricular music, but, but specifically kind of targeting how to use Chrome Music Lab. And, you know, you, when you're t teaching things like, um, I, I love teaching symmetry and patterns, repeating patterns, um, because you can, you can create all manner of different pictures and images and it will translate them into sound as well but what you can also do is is you know if you get a people just clicks wildly and randomly and you listen to it and you go well does this work for you and they go well no it doesn't well why doesn't it work for you and you start opening up those conversations whereas if, if you have a people who is quite methodical and, and and counts where they put things and works out and suddenly it sounds a bit more like a piece of music that I might, they might have wanted to produce. Like, well, why is this one better? And, and it, it's the immediacy of it is absolutely fantastic. And again, that's what comes by. I, I was talking to you about boom whackers. Immediacy in music is really, really important and accessing things straight away because you can see results straight away. Um, and one of the things I did just as, a, as an aside is I, I bought a, just a, a small little portable Bluetooth speaker with, a, with an, aux, a kind of an aux lead as well. So what I can do is I can, wander around the classroom and plug in their iPads or their laptops so they can listen to what everybody else has done. It's a really quick way of assessing what people have done because you can plug it in, press play, and everyone can hear it and go, oh, that's really good. 
I, I want to do that. Or how did you do that? Or let's see it. And then, you know, if you, if you, a bit more kind of tech au fait, you can maybe cast it to your screen so they can see what they've done as well. Um, yeah, you, there's, there's hours worth of work in Chrome User Lab. Honestly, it's, it's, you know, if you haven't investigated it before, you need to investigate it because there's all sorts of different things. Um, and it, yeah, you know, I'm in the, in the process of writing um, uh, a, a, a document. I'm not sure whether you could call it a book just yet, but looking at kind of cross-curricular um, entry points using music. Um, and there's a, there's a big heavy section on maths and music um, because, you know, this comes back to um, timetabling. You know, if you haven't got time to teach a music lesson, well, why don't you teach your music and your maths lesson? You know, why don't you teach symmetry through Chrome Music Lab? But actually what you're doing is you're getting the pupils to think logically about their patterns, where they're placing their, 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 their blocks in a symmetrical way or in a repeating pattern kind of way. So they're thinking mathematically, but actually what they're doing is they're working musically. You know, you, 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 know, you do have to be a little, you can be very clever with, with where you find your music lessons. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily a dedicated music lesson um, because, you know, timetables are, are packed. Yeah. You know, there's no two ways about it. Yeah, I think you have to be because there, there aren't enough hours in the day for all the things we want to teach kids. And no, you know, and like for me, I'm also like, don't don't teach data handling in science lessons because you're going to cover that in maths or or vice versa. You know that that's one yeah. together. And yeah, absolutely with music because you're you're absolutely right. Music and mathematics are are very closely related, if not um, yeah. brother and sister. And you know, it's it's like the penny is starting to drop. But and I'm thinking. I want to go and implement this in class straight away. You know, that, that consistency, doing things every day, little bits, I think that would have made a massive difference to my practice. And, you know, because like I say, I'm coming at this from an angle of someone who loves music, but just can never fit it in. But I think, and yeah, I think th those principles of what people do really well, you know, I think come across really strongly. And yeah. just as an aside myself, we have been... Um, we have a woodwind progression where children start off very young with the ocarina and then you're moving yep. on the clarinet as they get older. But obviously the last, well, two academic years, there hasn't been much woodwind. Yeah, that's gone. So yeah, we, there's, there's gone. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I was, I was going to say that there, there, there's, there, that's been kind of the, uh, the, the best way for me to put that is, so years, years ago now, the, the, they came up with a, with a, a thing called wider opportunities, which is probably very similar to what you're talking about, where um, there was kind of this disparity between who, who was learning a musical instrument and who wasn't learning a musical instrument. And basically it came down to um, the children that passed the, the listening test were the ones that got the chance to learn a musical instrument and then others didn't. Um, and then as time went on and budgets were squeezed, it then became who can afford to learn an instrument um, and then, but then what they did is they, they introduced this thing called wider opportunities where basically they would take in their, their music teachers, their peripatetic staff. And instead of teaching one or two children, they were teaching whole classes, which I think is probably what you were talking about. They start off with a, with one instrument and then they progress through different things. Um, and again, that's something that, that they started doing in Swansea as well, um, is they started sending someone in to do whole class teaching. And again, it sounded like a big bunch. We, we had brass teaching. It was great. But it sounded like for, for 50 minutes on a Thursday afternoon, we had a, a room full of Mexican taxis all beeping horns at each other. And it was great. But it was great because the kids were accessing it. You know, they were they were enjoying it. And like you said, some would then maybe go on to progress to other things or they'd make, they would make the instruments more complicated. So, yeah, the woodwind ones are a great one. Start with an ocarina because, again, you've got that immediacy. You, you put it to your lips, you blow, you've got a sound. Perfect. And then as, as they get older and understand how that, uh, that instrument works. And I got to say, you know, think something like a clarinet, I really struggle with, with reeded woodwind instruments. I, I, that's one instrument I, you know, I would happily admit to not being able to play at all because I really struggle with it. So. Yeah. And just, just as you say that, I'm thinking of walking past year five on a Thursday afternoon and, you know, it, it's almost a bit like, um, you know, in star Wars in the cantina thing. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's a really <laughs> melodic sound you know even when played badly it's still really yeah. interesting to listen to and yeah but yeah but i think i think the schools made a decision that they want every child to have the opportunity to play an instrument um, yeah. and i'm not sure how many of those were sourced through outside programs probably quite a substantial amount but um, yeah i think that's that's something that they hold dear and um, yeah. but at the minute you... we've, we've gone to garage band because like yeah. you said, 
of all the reasons you described. You've, you've got that immediacy. You've got that chance to explore with sound and composition. So we don't lose, you know, X number of months. Because I think it'll probably be September before woodwind becomes a, a yeah. realistic possibility at the earliest. You know. Yeah, I did. You know, I, there's there'll be a lot of people that say they don't like the recorder, um, <laughs> but the the recorder is probably one of my favorite instruments. Um, played well played well it is absolutely unbelievable and again it's 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 easy to kind of start off with i think that's that's why as as, as much as parents moan and teachers moan about listening to kids blasting down their recorder because it's 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 funny to make a really high-pitched whistling noise um but again they're they're really easy to to access they're very very accessible very very quickly um and i think i think that is really key for for children and young people because it doesn't matter how um it doesn't matter how talented you are or how, you know, um, how much you're willing to work on something. If something doesn't progress well enough in time, you're going to lose interest in it, you know? And, and there's been times, you know, in the past, I think it's one of the reasons why I didn't really stick with um, doing grades on the piano, for example, because I'd spent so long playing the trumpet from an early age that it just made sense to me. Whereas transferring that skill to playing a different instrument across two hands, across two staves, it, it didn't click straight away for me. So I was kind of, I was very quickly against it. I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I should. And, and the same goes for, for learning instruments. You know, I've, I've seen some people play, um, I, um, just do amazing things with, with recorders. You know, people still see them as kind of little tutti tuna day type things but if you kind of think outside the box a little bit actually you can do some great things with them because like i said they're accessible so yeah and they've got they've got the the fundamentals of music contained within them like you say it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah but you're absolutely right they can be quite great and whenever <laughs> you decide to <laughs> full whack for it and um, yeah i do with my kids too um, and i suppose are there any pitfalls that uh, schools who struggle to provide you know, decent standard music that we should try and avoid? I, I, I pretty much is the, the opposite of what you said. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on where I'm, I'm not a big fan of people um, teaching a music lesson just to tick a box to say they've taught a music lesson. And the same goes for everything. It's not just music. It's a, any subject. Um, you know, getting to the end of a term and going, oh, I haven't taught this. I better do a quick RE lesson. It, it's, not, it's not good practice. Um, and people will try and get around it by doing things like having a celebration week. Marvellous. Look, we've do, we're doing a whole week of expressive arts. That's great. But actually, if you take that week worth of expressive arts and spread it across the year, you're not really providing a great provision for your, for your subjects, if I'm honest. Um, and some people won't like me saying that because people will do... I, I, and please don't take this as me saying I don't like celebration weeks. I actually really do like celebration weeks. I like it when a school maybe takes chunks out of their timetable and say, do you know what? This week, we're going to spend the entire week doing some really interesting science investigations. We're just going to knock our timetable on the head. We're going to put a load of, we're going to get people in to talk about stuff. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's going to be an amazing week, but it's a supplement on top of the science they're teaching throughout the year. And the same goes for, for the expressive arts. You know, people will put on a, a week of things. We'll get musicians in, we'll get artists in to work with the kids. We'll do this. We'll, we'll get a dance teacher in to do something. We'll do a, a drama workshop. It'll be fantastic. And at the end of the week, we'll take a load of photographs, put it on the blog. And there you go. That, this is our expressive arts. How good are we? But if you walked into a classroom and said to a kid, uh, right, can you, can you, ah, let's listen to this piece of music. Can you tell me about it? And they look at you blankly going, you know, they haven't actually learned anything. They've done some really nice activities, but they haven't learned anything. And, you know, that's been a real, you know, learning is one of the biggest things that's come up in the last few years in terms of research. You know, we need to get pupils to learn. And the only way to do it is by doing it regularly, you know. So please, by all means, you know, anyone listening, do your celebration weeks. They are lovely. I love a celebration week. They are absolutely brilliant. And it's a great opportunity to kind of wind, wind down away from your, your, the, the day to day grind of your timetable because timetables are, are hard work. You know, sometimes you look at your time and go, oh, it's Friday and I don't want to do this, but I've got to because, I've, you know, I need to do it at this particular point. But as long as those things are supplementing and adding on to your curriculum, that's the important thing. I think where people just use them as a tick box exercise, then it's, it's not good quality teaching because just doing an activity as a, as a one-off, you're not going to learn anything by doing that. 
I'm afraid. And, it's, and that, that goes for every subject, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm not talking from a musical point of view anymore. It's, it's everything, you know, you know, people will be in uproar if you, if you didn't teach maths at all, and then you did a maths week and go, oh, look at all this maths that we've done. Isn't it great? You know, they, they would ask questions and rightly so. So why, why, why then behave like that towards other, other subjects? You know, um, I think that's the one major thing that is a big bugbear for me is, is where schools shoehorn in a, in a week like that and, and say that they're teaching those subjects when they, they're not. They're, they're providing some nice opportunities to do those subjects at that particular point. But in terms of learning progression, I, you know, I would question whether any learning and progression is actually happening at all. Yeah, I know. That, I know that sounds quite negative, but I, but I think it is a, it is an important point to make. Yeah, no, I think it's fair, I and mean, it goes back to what you said earlier on about um, if it's happening consistently, then pupils will value it. You know, if they see, like for instance, me teaching twenty minute music lesson one random Friday, they're not really going to care, are they? But if it's nope. something that we do and we show them that we value then it becomes a part of the, the sort of the, the identity of the yeah. class and the school. So I think you, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. I was like, yes, that, that that's probably the most important reason to be consistent is so that everybody, everybody buys in, everybody values it. Um, yeah. Um, I, th- I think we're, we're in a bit of a, a golden age of, um, of research and availability for things. Um, I think the internet for all it's, for all of it's, downsides is actually a really great resource for for finding things that we can do um and i think long gone are the days of i I'm, I'm, i don't want to name names of things but i am i'm going to na- name music express as an example um because at, at the time when when music express was released in in i think it was 2000 2001 maybe it was perfect for what the national curriculum was you know it it, it covered all of the skills that you needed to and it did it in a way which was planned for the teachers they didn't really need to think about it and again we talked about this before you know we were talking about um thinking about how you're teaching rather than what you're teaching but as time has gone on and particularly with the internet and social media and things like that i think a lot of the content for pre-made schemes needs um updating and the danger is that people still fall back on, like I said before, things that they've used for the last 20 or 30 years that are not relevant and contextual to the pupils we have in front of us. Um, and it's all well and good putting a CD into the CD player and putting this song on that you've sang for the last 15 years with your classes. But, you know, some of them are going to sit there and they're going to be like, what on earth is this? What, what are you making me do? Um, and um, funny enough, this, this is a big aspect of um, what's happening in Wales generally with the new curriculum is um, the, the curriculum now is becoming very fluid and changeable. You know, it's, you don't do the same thing year on year on year on year um, because it's comfortable and it's worked. You do things and you adapt them based on the pupils you have in front of you. So one year you might have a, a cohort, cohort that for whatever reason, they love singing nursery rhymes. So that's what you're going to do. Whereas you might have one the year after that are much more um, grown up in terms of their musical tastes and you have to switch it out completely. But what you do is you, you pick activities which are um, changeable. You know, you're not, you're not doing an activity because it fits with the, the, the sequence of lessons that you took from a book 20 years ago um, because it's, you, you know, you're keeping it up to date. Um, so yeah, the, the other thing that, I would probably avoid doing um, in terms of trying to find things that fit with your theme and topic. And again, themes and topics uh, are questionable. I'm not sure if I'm, you know, right to say that, but sometimes um, the, the themes and topics that people have been working on are not necessarily the right entry point for your, your curriculum. You know, I know schools out there do run their, their curriculums based on a book instead of a theme and a topic, or um, you know, the, you get some really kind of outfield things like here's an object, let's make a, a curriculum from that, and it can go a little bit in the opposite direction. But I think the 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 topification of of music, um, I think, is one that needs to be avoided because if you pull in things from a pre-written scheme, it's not necessarily going to be contextual to what it is that those children are supposed to be learning about. And again, if you want them to really engage with something, you know, say, say your topic is the Romans and you're suddenly pulling a, a, a series of music lessons from um, a pre-written 
script, which is totally different, just because you need to teach that skill in music. Well, that, that doesn't work uh, for me. Um, you know, you can take those skills, take those activities and flip them around. But, you know, you need to do that work, I think. Um, so, yeah. And do you think... Um... Do you think it's easier for larger schools to deliver a high quality music curriculum because of the sheer, you know, the, the number of people they can share the work across? You know, do you think there's a difference in in a one form entry school and, and and what capacity they have? What are you asking? Yeah, ab- oh, absolutely. Um, and again, this is the, di- the difficulty with anything to do with curriculum is that it's it's not a one size fits all. For anyone because like you said you know i i've i've been fortunate enough to work in both so currently i'm working in a one-form entry school and you know the, the work is massive but i i have complete control over you know what happens in my classroom but on the flip side i've worked in a two and a half form entry school and we've planned across um like two year groups so i worked with a year three four team so there was five of us so in terms of workload it makes work a lot a lot easier because I would take the music stuff and I would take, I did music and science. I think I did where someone else would take the literacy. Someone else would take the, the numeracy and the Welsh and whatever. Um, so in terms of resourcing that way, it was much easier, um, but it was still reliant on, it wasn't massively scripted. It was still reliant on that individual teacher taking those resources and things and, and delivering them for their class in the way that suits their class, which was quite nice. Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't everyone must have this in their book on this particular day and it must be exactly like this because it must be the same um it just meant that the workload itself was was shared out so yeah absolutely and i do appreciate that you know in terms of smaller schools and workload music probably is lower down so i think you know there are things out there but you know if again talking about investment there's a a music um provider called i believe it is charanga um is the name of it and i think if you are part of a music hub in england i think some of them do actually subscribe to it and you can access it so and when i was talking about things like things being more up to date and contemporary that stuff is all online and it's really accessible for teachers and so and and it's adaptable as well you know there are some there are some things that are in there that are kind of non-topic linked if that makes sense it's it's an activity to develop listening or an activity to develop um, rhythm and timing, which is actually what your music curriculum should be um, rather than linking every single aspect of it to your topic because you, you lose the, the musical focus, as it were. Nice. So you've almost got, this is the journey that you take to become a more proficient, not necessarily just musician, but appreciator of music. Um, yeah. Compre- comprender of music, comprender. Oh, I'm getting confused with Spanish now. Com- yeah, com- comprehender. Comprehender um, <laughs> of music, and and then everything else co- you make suitable to your class. You know, so you, yeah. you know the journey that the, that the average kid goes on, and then you can make it relevant. Yeah, I I, I get that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, nice. And if I if I want to get better at teaching music whose blog should I be reading? What, um, what book should I be looking for? Um, again, we're, we're in a, a really great position. Um, the, the first person I would, if, if, if you're on Twitter and I think, I assume most people listening to this probably are on Twitter. I would follow, um, Jimmy Rotherham. He is at music edu for all. Um, and he might, he's probably popped up on people's timelines every now and then he was in the news a couple of years ago because his school up in Leeds, I believe they are, was offering, epic amounts of music to their school and their results went absolutely through the roof they were they were just phenomenal um and they 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 provide lots of regular music um so i I would definitely follow him um and he's just been working with uh nicola benedetti uh at the benedetti foundation and for anyone that doesn't know who she is she's a very very excellent solo violin player uh from scotland she is and She's heavily involved in music education. They've, they've just put together a series of, I think, 18 lessons. I think it was six lessons for uh, foundation phase for the Key Stage 1 and 12 lessons, I think, for Key Stage 2. Don't quote me on that. I would need to just double-check the numbers. But basically, they, they put these things together for um, 
for pe- people working at home, specifically for home learning. And they are very much about developing skills, developing that, those senses of timing and pulse. So, so taking away necessarily the, the topic aspect of it and just focusing on the skills. So yeah, I would definitely follow them. Um, and again, if you go to, I think Jamie's um, page on Twitter, I think he, he's got a tweet where she links to, to that resource, the resources, it's, it's pretty easy to find. I think if you Google it as well, if you Google the Benedetti Foundation, you'll, you'll find it pretty quickly. Um, another Twitter person is at Nick Sermon. Um, he, again, at, at the start of lockdown, I think it was last year, he started putting together a website called music-education.co.uk. And basically he's just pulled any free resources he could find for um, teaching music. And it's blogs, it's websites, it's any kind of resource you could possibly want. Because I think in in anything to do with um, with teaching, you know, you, you say about if anyone wants to improve their teaching of music, well, it's the same as improving a lot of things. You 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 have to you have to do a bit of work. You can't magically become this better teacher. You know, you're going to have to go out and look for stuff. You're going to have to read things. You're going to have to listen to things. You know, watch some videos, read a blog, engage with that community of things. Because at the minute, that's our best opportunity for improvement. You know, I, I, I've led um, inset sessions in the last couple of years, specifically on music, because we, we've had a target of improving expressive arts. And one of the first questions I said was to, to, to the staff in front of me, when was the last time you had any training on music at all? And their response, they were really honest. They said, last time I was taught anything about music was during my training. Brilliant. And most people will probably say that to you. Thing is, their training was 20 years ago. And it's, you know, that, that CPD in terms of people going out and teaching tra- and teaching teachers in that aspect um, doesn't really exist because schools have got other priorities, unfortunately, you know, they, they do, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, you know, at no point have I said music's the most important subject, you know, I'm aware that there are other subjects, um, but schools don't go out of their way necessarily to, to have training in music because if they've got a day's worth of training, there's probably a lot of other things they could put in there that are going to impact the school. So we, we need to be going out there and, and reading and engaging with people online. I think that's the best way to, to improve, improve practice, you know, and there, there's a wealth of stuff available on YouTube as well. Um, just, just through some simple searches, if I'm honest, but, and I mentioned this before, you know, if you do want to improve, you have to practice as well. You know, you can't, you're not going to wake up in the morning and be a proficient guitar player. If you, if you want to share something, you know, you do need to be one or two steps ahead and that does take a little bit of work. I think, um, you know, those who listen to education podcasts in their free time, I reckon they're part of the group who are willing to put that legwork in. So what, what we'll do is we'll share the all the links in the show notes um, and then obviously, and maybe give those people that you've named a tweet, um, you know, when this episode goes out and then people will be able to join the dots up yep. on, on who they are. That's, that's awesome. Um, and just, uh, just before you carry on, just a bit of self promotion. I actually I do write a blog myself as well. Um, my blog is uh, musicularium.wordpress.net. Just to put that in. But I, funny enough, since since I've not been physically in school, um, my my blogging output has been minimal because I, what I tend to do is I tend to give things a go in school and then write about them on my blog. So it's been kind of on the back burner a little bit, but I, I mentioned before that I'm going to start tying all those things together as a kind of complete, hopefully readable resource. Um, again, you know, looking back at um, timetabling and people being short on time to teach a music lesson, looking at ways that you could put music into your other lessons. So you're still teaching, you know, you, you, you're killing two birds with one stone to, you know, pardon the, the metaphor as it were um because you know we do have to be smart in how we how we approach our delivery of stuff you know that's not to say that people should be completely ignoring you know standalone music lessons you know those things should still happen but i'm hoping to be able to kind of provide ways in through other subjects that can, people can get on board with yeah i think i think the need for that balance comes across quite clearly in what you're saying um but definitely you know i think your blog is the first place you got to start. And when you're, when you're saying you know, <laughs> where I can get better at music, you know, well, I, I do write something. You know, you're, I think you're too modest for your own good, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your work has inspired many and will continue to do so for a long time. Where, where do you draw your sources of inspiration from? Um, 
<laughs> this is actually a really hard question. Um, in, in terms of music or in terms of education or... I think you can interpret it however you, okay. you want to. Free, freeing it up a little bit. Um, I, I, you know, I do take a lot of inspiration for things I see online. You know, I, I, I'll happily admit that I, I, I see some things that I just think are really great. I think that's how I, how I came across um, Chrome Music Lab. I was, I, I was looking for one thing and I happened to find that and kind of started down that, that rabbit hole of working out how to use it in my own way. Um, I, I tend to, I, I fall into things. I kind of just find things randomly. Um, you know, in terms of, in terms of music, I, I like to be kind of, I don't know. It's, I, I take a lot of inspiration from film music and film composers um, because there's a lot of narrative in what they do um, because that's, that's the, that's the nature of the job, you know? Um, I, because it, it leads into a lot of, um, discussion uh, there's lots of literacy you can do from film music there's lots of um lots of art as well and um i think i take a lot of those aspects of those compositional aspects and try and kind of put them into how i teach composition as well because it's all about storytelling i like i like that aspect of of music um yeah so that's, that's a tricky question um because i i kind of just i i explore online a lot um, I think because music hasn't necessarily been at the forefront of um, people's minds just in, in terms of development, there hasn't been a huge amount of um, easily accessible things until very recently. Um, so, yeah, I know, you know, I mentioned Jimmy Rotherham before, but I, I kind of look at that, look at how he works and his, his passion and his enthusiasm for it, which is just never ending. You know, and it's massive, and that constant need to to drive the importance of it, um, and just keep keep on top of the you know the message in that respect. I would definitely say that. Um, so yeah, it's a, it is a tricky one. <laughs> That's actually a really hard question to answer in terms of inspiration. Um, there's 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 one composer who I who I came across um, in the last five or six years or so. His name is Eric Whitaker. I'm not sure you heard of heard of him he's a um he's a choral composer and one of the things i like about him is he he's not afraid of being repetitive with what he does you know he but you you will listen to his music and it feels really deep and thick and harmonious but it's actually quite simple the simplicity in it is what i like and, and i've taken a lot on board of what he's he's done um, and again, a bit like film composers, I try and I try and add that into how I kind of approach um, composition and performance as well. You know, saying saying showing that something doesn't have to be complicated for it to be good. You know, you can do. Um, I, I composed a a thing on um, it was a meditation on the last post a few years ago, and that, that was directly inspired by Eric Whitaker because you know I, I've played the last post for the last. Uh, nearly 30 years you know this, again this year was uh, last november was one of the first novembers in a long time that i haven't played the last post um and i kind of took his idea uh, funny enough, i funny i went to see him play uh, he conducted a concert at the albert hall and i was blown away by the simplicity but the beauty of his music as well so right i i wonder if i can do this can i compose something that just uses long notes and it was it was a challenge um but the the, the upside from it is it's, it's created this really thoughtful and beautiful thing that actually, if you were to give it to other people to say, play this, all they need to do is press one key and hold it down. And it will, and together, it, cre it would create this really beautiful kind of lush harmony together. And, and again, I try and take that approach in school by trying to show that it doesn't have to be complicated to be good. You know, you don't have to be sitting on a guitar shredding you know, you can sit there and play just long notes and it works really well. And I remember he did an interview um, and it, it just kind of, th this aspect is kind of me in school as well, generally, is that he, uh, he did an interview and he talked about when he was at um, college in America and he had to, he was in his final year and his professors said to him right now, Eric, you need to compose something serious. Okay. 
you need to compose a serious piece of music, okay? He's like, okay, I'll go away and compose a serious piece of music. And he went away and he did not compose a serious piece of music at all. He composed a piece of music called Godzilla Eats Las Vegas. And it... (laughs) (laughs) But it is brilliant. Because you watch it, and it's, it's very much a performance thing. And it's about 15 minutes long, but it is absolutely outstanding. It's like watching a piece... It's like watching a film, but... It, but um, audio, like you know, you're listening to it instead of watching it. I, w- I won't spoil it. I'm going to let people go away and look it up because it, go and look it up. Go go and look up Godzilla Eats Las Vegas by Eric Whitaker, and honestly, you will you will not regret it because it is amazing. But I love that attitude where someone had said to him, "You need to do something really serious," and he went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that." I'm, I'm going to be really serious and just went away and did his own thing anyway. And I, and I, I really like that aspect, you know, just trying to put that into trying to get that, as, you know, attitude into the children saying, you know, what, if you want to, if you want to go and do that and you like the sound it makes, go and do that. You know, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not, you know, and if you, if you know, if you can explain to me how it meets the brief that I've given you, then brilliant. If you can't, then, well, then we can talk about, you know, stylistic differences and, and progress later on. Um, but I, I just like that attitude of just, yeah, I'm going to not do what you've asked me to do. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go do this thing because I like it. Um, and you know, that's something we haven't talked about actually is, is, is liking things, doing things that you like, you know, I, I will go out of my way. If I'm, if I know that there's an artist that I've chosen, I will find pieces of music by that artist that I like to listen to. And I'll try and share that with the pupils. You know, because sometimes that's actually what it comes down to. It doesn't come down to whether it's good or not. It's just, do you like it? You know, you've, you've created that piece of music on that on, on Garage Do you like what you've done? Yeah. Awesome. Great. We can talk about the, the ins and outs of it musically another day, but if you like it and you're happy with it, then you, you've achieved, you know? And that, I think that's, that's probably one of my, my, my biggest inspirations is just not, not taking it too seriously, but being able to produce things through simplicity and... Uh, Doing your own thing, I like that. Nice. Um, so you, during this, you, you've given us so much to to think about and to learn from. Do you have any final pieces of advice for teachers you know who are now feeling energized and ready to up their music game? Oh, I I would say just just give it a go. Just just plan plan a couple of lessons. Have a look at what it is you actually want to achieve and go for it. I think one of the reasons why people don't necessarily um, maybe teach as much music is because they're worried about things going wrong. That's, you know, that's what I would say is just give things a go and run with it. And like I said, you know, pick things that you like, pick things that you're comfortable with. Um, I guarantee you, and you, you can ask this question to everyone and say, oh, what, what, what's your favorite kind of music? Most people will tell you straight away exactly what they like listening to. One or two will say, I don't listen to music. Actually, that's, yeah, I reckon that's just a lie. You know, if you, if you dig deep enough, you'll find that they've got some really obscure Himalayan nose flute love, which is fine. You know, they, I absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking that at all. It's just that some people are worried about sharing their passions, for what they like in music. And once you get over that, once you get out of that mindset of people making fun, but it does come down to culture. You know, you do have to build that, that into what you, if you've got a really open culture in your school where you can share things, you know, you spend your weekends doing um, doing some obscure dancing or you spend your weekends, I don't know, playing chess. I don't know. I love playing chess. It's great. Um, and just being confident in that and just giving it a go and showing people what you do and what you're into actually will have, I think, will reap really much better results than um, shying away and not doing it because you're going to be embarrassed. You know, things will happen. And I mentioned this right early on. You will make mistakes and things will be supposedly embarrassing, but actually it's, it's not going to be one of those stories that people tell for years and years and years. It's not one of those you know, stories where people show up to work in the wrong shoes or something, you know, um, things will go wrong. And yeah. So just, I, I, my, my advice would just be to get out, give it a go. Um, but stick with things that you know, and that you like, so that you are confident in what it is that you're doing. I think that's what I would say. Nice. Sound advice. I reckon listeners are going to be properly pumped up for teaching music on <laughs> Monday morning. All right. So you've given us so much to think about, Andy. Thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, 
And I reckon, you know, we've only scratched the surface of what we could have talked about and hopefully get you back on sometime soon and we'll go yeah. further. Awesome. Thank you very yeah. much. No, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.